WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Still broadcasting in high definition, mono, AM 1570 quality. Make sure you're setting a, uh, a spot for us. Also going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. I'm wearing my Fadeley's gear because I'm going to be at Fadeley's on Friday for the holidays. Reminding everyone out there, if you're shipping crab cakes, if you have your favorites, Fadeley's, Costas, Pappas, Conrad's, we have sponsors here. Ship all of them for the holidays because they are delicious. Dan Rogers is going to join us on Friday as part of the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Goodwill and Window Nation. Uh, 866-90-NATION. You buy two, you get two free and 0% financing on the window deal. I'm staying nice and warm and uh, energy efficient here right now. And then next week, we are celebrating the 31st anniversary of this guy here doing sports radio. Uh, on the 13th of December, it'll be my 31st year. On the 15th, on Thursday, we'll be celebrating at Costas in Dundalk with Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Gina Shock of the Go-Go's and a whole bunch of old rock and roll friends from Hammerjacks and the documentary. This guy's an old friend. He um, ran the Baltimore Orioles back in the day in the 80s and early 90s, went on to the Texas Rangers and MLB and did a whole bunch of other things. Now is the good professor at Georgetown University talking about sports media and business. What an interesting time to have you on. I still remember those pictures of you on the Mm -hmm. camel over in Qatar. Um, I thought you were going to be going to Qatar for all of this. I don't know if that was ever part of this or not, but – you're here and you've been watching it on television every morning like all the, you'll yeah. miss it next week like all the rest of us it's it's been a hell of a tournament marty conway how you been man i've been good first of all thank you and man that sounds exciting on your 35th and 31st anniversary in your show uh the go-go's were a big deal still are a big deal actually so you know well, gina shock cool. is from dundalk she grew up about a mile, mile and a half from I could walk to where she grew up. I okay. had always heard this for years and years and years. She's yeah. from Baltimore. And then the yep. documentary came out. Yep. And, you know, she's from Dundalk. You know, she <laughs> sounds like one of us. And John Allen and I from Charm City Devils and Stone Horses and Child's Play, we're best pals. And we were so we said, man, she's a ball. Like, do you know her? I never met her. I've never met her. How did you know? He's the greatest drummer from Dundalk. I never met her. And mm-hmm. then she showed up a month ago in town signing her book. And I invited her over, and she had such a good time. She only stayed about a half an hour. She's like, we got to do this again for the holidays. I'm home. So that's where, that's the genesis of all Fantastic. of this is that we have a rock and roll Hall of Famer yeah. drummer from Dundalk yeah. and, that has never properly yeah. been loved up by Dundalk. She oh, remembered right. the Penguins at East Point Mall. It was crazy. Oh, wow. How that's are you? Fantastic. What's going on World Cup? Keeping you up early Listen in the morning? Yeah, I'm, absolutely. Yeah. We're actually now in the uh, – we're actually in the second day, first and second day where we haven't had soccer from the world cup in the last uh, two and a half weeks, we got so caught up in having it every day, at least one match a day, sometimes as many as four matches a day. Um, and right now we're in that lull between the uh, round of 16 and the quarterfinals, which begin. Uh, so no, I, I wasn't able to, I had some other commitments, but a couple of colleagues are over there. I've still kept touch with many of my uh, friends that are actually there and r- working with the Qatari national team and, others like that. And I can just say that, you know, in the run up to the cup for years, 10 years, 12 years, whatever it was, constant narrative about what Qatar was doing, not doing uh, standards that they weren't maintaining, whatever it was. First match kicks off. None of that gets discussed virtually anymore. Um, In fact, I just read yesterday that 70% of the U.S. media has gone left Qatar didn't once the U.S. team was eliminated and uh, hotels started costing them more money uh, they pulled back and left so you won't hear about I don't think that stuff anymore but having from what I understand and from what I've seen um, this has been first of all I think we all have to be honest about um, you know what the background is and getting the getting the World Cup in 2010. I'm only two episodes into the Netflix set bladder yeah. thing. I, I yeah. mean, there's five I mean, episodes. Not... I know most of the story. You and I yeah. have discussed that how filthy Russia and Qatar were in getting this and the bag money. I mean, that's that's all on yeah. the. I mean, everybody who wants to know the truth yeah. about that can know the truth, right? Yeah, there's there's been so many books written. I would recommend Chuck Blazer's book American Hustler, which really goes into. He was uh, witness number one in all of the FBI's uh, uh, wiretap and everything else. So it's all it's it's been written. It's I don't think there's any real question about it. it's been investigated um, by Michael Garcia and and on and on. But but having said that, if you look at the fact that what has happened in the in that region in the MENA region, so the Gulf, the five or six Gulf cooper- cooperation countries, uh, MENA in the North African countries, Tunisia. And I stop at Morocco, Morocco into the quarterfinals. The first time 
that an Arab nation has been in the quarterfinals of the World Cup, in the history of the World Cup, coming up on 100 years, by the way. Um, that's what this World Cup was about. When we traveled over there back and forth many, many times, yes, it was going to be centered in Doha and in the country of Qatar and Dubai's a plane right away and, and, and all these other places. But the fact that folks from Saudi Arabia could come over the border pretty easily and watch Saudi Arabia beat Argentina, the fact that Moroccans could fly pretty easily to Doha and watch their team in person advance into the quarterfinals is what this is about. That will ignite football, as they say over there, into that region like never before, because instead of every time the Olympics or the World Cup comes and they have to watch their heroes three, four time zones away on television, now they could either see it in person or see it live in their own time zone. That's what this is about. And, and from the standpoint of success, that's what really matters here. The stadiums, who built them, what the other issues are in that country, um, they're all relative to, you know, the customs of that region. That's not going to change. Um, but the fact that football now belongs in Arab countries in a big way in the Arab region, that's what this World Cup has achieved. And uh, we'll see what happens from there. I suspect that I know the U.S. is hosting in 2026, but the World Cup will be available for bid in 2030 and 2034. I'd be surprised if Saudi Arabia is not involved in some way in the, in the next available round, or now Morocco being there and available, I think it will come back to that region. Uh, whether it's split over two or three countries, that's maybe ultimately what happens. But that's what the story, when it's all said and done and it's over, that's the uh, narrative that'll be written about this World Cup. Marty Conway, the good professor, is here. You can follow him out on LinkedIn. Smart people do. Twitter, when I'm not thrown off of Twitter. I got suspended from Twitter last week. I still don't even know. I didn't do anything wrong, and I'm filling out the forms and standing in line uh, with Elon Musk, amongst others. But the 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 cup coming here in four mm -hmm. years, and you and yep. I have been through this with Terry yep. Hazeltine and D.C. and Baltimore and Boston and Robert Kraft and the <laughs> NFL and all that. And people are like, man, we got four years. I'm like, no, it's only three and a half years, and it's going right. to sneak up. I mean, this That's is right. this is going to happen quicker than we think. Yep. The backside of the U.S. doing well and us watching, whether it's somebody that doesn't know anything about soccer that sees Clint Dempsey for the first time or Landon Donovan for the first time or any of the ladies that have been broadcasting, this has been a um, – a soccer reunion and a little bit of love in going back to Alexi Lalas and yep. the guy dressed like Alexi Lalas at the American game with the beard and all that from 30 years ago. Um, it, it was a bringing together of soccer people. And I think at five in the morning, eight in the morning, 10 in the morning, yep. two in the afternoon, whatever, all day long, soccer people on my timeline staying into this, this is a nice it's certainly different than 94, right? There is, in 1990, nobody knew the cup was coming here. I think everybody's aware that this thing's happening here. And I think for a guy like me who knows better, I know what we missed out on. I, I, I didn't need to have three weeks of this in, on my television from Doha to know how we, as a city, as yeah. a community, mm -hmm. that this region mm -hmm. really lost out big time on this. And it's, um, it's, it, it's tragically, um, it'll, it'll, it's not coming back here anytime soon. This was yeah. a major loss. And we talked yeah. about this five, six months ago, but now yeah. seeing it, I'm like, oh my God, how do we F this up? Yeah. Yeah. You, you've seen the shots of fans, you know, where they're, how they're moving around, what they're, where they're staying, uh, how they travel. Um, I just read yesterday that it's been just a little under a million people have traveled to this point in the world cup. There'll be probably another three or 400,000. We'll see what happens. Uh, but uh, around 800,000 have traveled into Doha so far. Um, they've had about two and a half million people uh, attend, different you know, folks attend actual matches. The, the numbers here in the U.S. will be you know, many, many mo more times that because the stadiums are already built. Everything's in place. It's just a matter of deciding where, you know, once they announce the draw and England is playing here and Argentina is playing here, whatever, people will decide to travel to those locations and the hotel reservations will pop and the car rentals will pop and the flights will pop. So well, it um, also pop for Vegas and for, for Disney yeah. world. And for when people come, they're going to yep. New York city, they're going to yep. do all of those things. Right. Yep. Yeah. The, again, unlike where it is right now, you're basically, <clears throat> it's a destination to go see soccer. Uh, maybe you check out Dubai or, you know, someplace like that, but here in the U S people will make a trip to Boston or they'll make a trip to New York. And they'll tie in other things around it. They'll go to Atlanta 
they'll tie in Orlando, like you mentioned, all those different things. Um, and so it'll really be about the commercial opportunities from the jump. And as you said, yeah, only three and a half years because it will be played in June and July of 2026. And the qualifying around the world, remember, we're changing from 32 teams, this current World Cup, to 48 teams in 2026. So by, by default, the qualifying has to start sooner because there's more potential teams involved. So you're going to start to see World Cup qualifying in some parts of the world begin this uh, this spring, <clears throat> the spring of 2023. Well, the thing so, that's fascinating for me is no Italy, no Sweden, no Ireland. You know, the, so some of the usual suspects not being involved in the tournament at all, right? Like yeah. they didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. And the notion that the U.S. has gotten better, Korea's gotten better, Japan's gotten better. We talked about Morocco, that there yeah. have been outside of the basis of South America and Europe, right? The 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 world has elevated. I mean, Canadians didn't play poorly, right? Like, um, there, there's there's been a real element. I mean, Japan sh could could have easily gone through on PKs against Croatia, yeah. right? So yeah. the 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 quality of soccer, as much as 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I've been on the air 31 years this week, Marty. So all of these years, it's well, we're not any good at that. We're you know we'll never be any good at that. We can't be the best in the world at that. I don't know. I um. I, I I thought Pulisic and the the drama around the abdominal injury and like mm -hmm. all of that. Um, there isn't much that brings Americans together these days in the era of Donald Trump and lies and deception and and and, uh, and you know and and J January sixth and like all of that. Yeah, the American soccer team at least flew the flag for a couple of weeks around here, and we felt like the United States at least a little bit on yeah. the pitch, right? Yeah. So there's two things there. Number one, the, this World Cup has succeeded largely without any success from North America or America, right? Uh, Canada did not make it through. Mexico did not make it through the, for the first time in like six World Cups. And the U.S. got through but ran into, you know, a really tough Netherlands team uh, who, who might be a threat in the final four, I think, overall, the way they're playing. Uh, so in that regard, the success of the Cup, there, but like you said, for the first time there's been three uh, Asian teams um, South Korea, Japan, and Australia made it into the round of 16. Uh, Morocco still standing from the MENA region in the quarters. Um, but yeah, so without Germany going through, without Spain advancing beyond where they were, without Italy even making it into the World Cup and a number of other countries like that, you've seen the spread of soccer because, you know, one of FIFA's goals back in 2000, 2010 and throughout was to spread more money into these nations for their soccer federations, for their football federations. And it's happened, right? And then you're going to see the Women's World Cup, which uh, next is being played in Australia and New Zealand, the same thing. They're going to eventually expand from 16 teams to 24 teams. So the spread of soccer, uh, which is why the NFL, pivot to the NFL for a second, why the NFL has been so aggressive now post-COVID to get to Europe for several games, to get to Mexico for another game, uh, they, they really feel like they need to plant their flag because soccer is exploding in these markets. And uh, so it's an opportunity. So the good news is, like I said, there'll be, um, you know, a 48 team World Cup here in 2026. And there'll be 45 other teams other than Canada, the U.S. and Mexico who automatically make that World Cup. There'll be 48, 45 other countries sending their fans, sending their teams to the U.S., uh, traveling around, spending a lot of money and discovering new opportunities. Marty Conway is here discussing all things <laughs> FIFA and uh, the World Cup coming here in three and a half years. We'll be watching the games next week uh, as well. I'll have some information on Tuesday, Wednesday for the semifinals. And of course, on uh, Sunday, next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for the actual final. And as it turns out, the Ravens got flexed into the Saturday afternoon game, screws up my yoga class, but it really helps me on Sunday the 18th uh, for the final. So uh, we'll be out somewhere good doing that. Uh, off the soccer pitch, I mean, you and I could sit here and talk about Chuck Blazer and American Huckster and we, we go through all of this, but um baseball this week i mean your primary sport the first yeah. thing that uh, you were known yeah. for mm -hmm. the Aaron judge thing the owners meetings where the orioles are and all this i mean i look i've been picking on the orioles for oh, about 31 years now and they're on the cusp of getting better and they're they we're going to spend money we're going to invest when it's time the Aaron judge thing's fascinating me because the giants are throwing money the padres are throwing money couldn't get him the yankees never lose their guy right like at the at the heart if the guy wants to remain a yankee the yankees will pay that guy to stay there even if his name's not ed whitson right like all these years later um they don't lose guys the off season for the orioles and for expectations i 
I just see these myopic, poor, slaughtered Orioles fans really thinking that the Orioles are going to be aggressive and free. Like there was some notion, what well, do ain't spend new money in a couple of years? They're going to spend money. And then I see the, the boys fighting with each other. And then Manfred has to play the, well, it's very clear to us. John Angelos is running the team. And I'm thinking Lou's lawyers probably don't think that. And John was in there. I mean, all of Lou's allegations appear to be factual to me when I look at them and see that John was estranged and not there. This, this baseball fight and free agency and the things that quality franchises need to do in the offseason to remain competitive, to stay in it. Part of that is spending money, even though our name's not Tampa Bay here. Where are the Orioles financially? Set me straight on yeah. how much money's really – I know they look poor. Stadium's empty. Downtown's a mess. Nobody comes to the games. Nobody went last year. They're not selling sponsorships. That's very obvious, right? I don't even know who the hell sells their sponsorships. But – and I don't see season ticket, buy a plan. I don't get ads from them. I don't – their players aren't here. Adley Rutschman's a superstar, but he's not going to sniff Baltimore, Maryland until – April 3rd or whenever opening day is that they have once again, it's Christmas time. There's no winter carnival. There's no, um, you know, moonlight madness. I mean, all these things you were a part of 30 years ago, where's the business of the Orioles other than dormant in the off season. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack there clearly. So from the standpoint of uh, spending more money, um, as Michael Elias said, some of that money that he's talking about spending will clearly go into players who are now arbitration eligible. So uh, the, uh, the the comment about spending money can be framed in a lot of different ways. You can spend money to bring in new players. And I think that's what most people heard when he said that was the kind of quote, you know, the idea of free agency. Um, but I, I think a, a good chunk of their new money that they have to spend will go into retaining uh, their arbitration eligible players. Um, center field, you know, uh, right field, you know, other places like that where they're going to have to spend. In terms of their overall uh, financial profile, I haven't seen, unless I, I have missed something and I may have along the way, I haven't seen a new infusion, infusion of media dollars, right? There's not been a new media deal announced. Like you said, there hasn't been a new broad sponsorship deal announced or something else. So I don't know where the new incremental money flowing in from. Well, I know they're making again. less from mess and than they've ever made. Right. Yeah. Like that, that's a fact. Yeah. And that means the nationals are making, everybody's making less money because there's less coming in. Correct. Court cutting. Well, yeah, yeah, there certainly is. Although those revenue payments are fixed to the team. So question is, do they still have the Delta between what they're bringing in and what they owe each of those teams? Um, so again, uh, uh, they did not re-sign Jordan Lyles. They replaced him, you know, with a sort of like for like type, uh, and maybe saved themselves a million or two dollars there. I don't know, but yeah. So it, like I said, at the end of the day, the financial profile of the team still puts them probably out of the thirty uh, MLB teams, puts them in the you know in the top. I'm sorry, in the bottom five or six in terms of what they have coming in. They're more like Pittsburgh and Tampa and uh, a few other places. So they like really that. are poor again, you know, even though they were wealthy 15 years ago with all the massive yeah. money that that yeah. has, that's dried up. The sponsorships dried up. The fan base is dried up, right? Like literally yeah. all of the fears of Mr. Angelos back in 2004 of a DC team coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's certainly, and when we could talk at the heart of all of this, but the putting yeah. the team in DC ended DC <laughs> forever. And we're, a generation gone from that yeah. now that that the the wealth of the Orioles needs to be created by Baltimore people and by the franchise right. itself and by local businesses and right now yeah. that is that's a real stretch I mean fans thinking they're going to spend money but I keep thinking there's this BAM money there's all right. and and I think of this with the Ravens all the time as their seats are empty and it's sixteen dollars to get into the games on game day and um nobody seems to care that I'm, I'm more upset about the empty seats at a Ravens game and people cheering on offense than the ownership is. But the foot, the baseball team has, I don't know, where is the upside? Where is the big sponsor? Where is the big deal coming from? Yep. Where is the swell of people coming back that will allow them, mm -hmm. not, not to sign Aaron Judge, because you can say that's right. a good signing or a bad signing, but what's going to keep Adley Rutschman around here at $248 million four years from now when it comes time to give him the deal? Yeah, I, I, you know, again, I don't see it yet. Now, Major League Baseball is generating 
excuse me, more dollars, which are going out to each of their 30 teams. So I'm sure there's some benefit from additional BAM sales that they make or new new media dollars with Fox and and uh, Warner Discovery Sports. Uh, it's not like the Amazon that. money in the NFL that was sort right. of like everybody's overpaying yep. to get involved in the right. NFL and, every, and Steve's getting a nice little check yep. that covers everything from, I mean, the Ravens expenses are paid the day they wake up, right? Just on national TV revenue. Literally, they don't need to do anything. Right. Yeah, m- most uh, most sports leagues now generate, with the exception of the NHL, uh, now generate you know as much possible. But the point of difference to your earlier question was how much local revenue do you produce? That's the difference between what the Dallas Cowboys do in the NFL and what the New York Yankees or Dodgers do in in Major League Baseball. They're generating so much more local revenue that they're able to invest that in other places. The other place that the Orioles won't have to spend as much this year that they've had over the last two to three years is that initial draft pick, right? They, they were drafting one, two, or five, and they're having to pay pretty significant bonuses to that person. Now, they, they won't have to do that. I think this year they're drafting 17th. Um, and so that profile will switch, and the dollars that they had to put in for top draft picks should be available for – either a major league roster or something else of the sort, but short term, longer term, that's the challenge is how do they change the profile of the financial stack of revenue and where does ticket revenue, where does local media, where does local sponsorship, those areas that are so important to get you to the point where you can sign a top level free agent uh, or something of the sort. Look, the Yankees are a completely different environment. The Dodgers are a different environment. What I understand from colleagues in in, uh, in baseball in the last 48 hours, one of the there's two things that brought Aaron Judge back from the West Coast when he could have signed in either San Francisco or San Diego, and that is number one, they were willing to give him a ninth year on his deal, and number two, they guaranteed him the the Yankee captain situation. So those are things that you know a team a franchise like Baltimore or Pittsburgh or Kansas City or Tampa. They just can't compete with. So they have to find other ways. And whether it's through Adley Rutschman and another crop of uh, young players coming through. But ultimately, that has to translate into at least 90 wins a season in order to likely qualify for the playoffs or perhaps even win a division. But in a division where the Red Sox just recently signed the top player who was available out of Japan or, or the Yankees signing Aaron Judge or what Tampa's doing or what Toronto's doing as well, makes it really difficult in that division. Even if you win 90 games, you may not be a playoff team. It was such a special year for the Orioles as it wraps up, you know, that they did well. And the, the, the civic part of me, the community guy in me, not the media guy fighting with Peter Angelos for two decades about access, but that part of me says, man, I really want them to build something here. And, it, and yeah. the disappointment of an off season that nothing had now, you know, if they, they go win 90 games next year, make the playoffs great. But I, I would say they, they are being judged <laughs> by their fan base here in regard to are we really operating differently or is it the same old, same old? It, 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 I mean, it's the Angelos boy, same old, same old. And Manford coming out on Team John, um, a- anything to say about that at, at this point? And I mean, I, I've had um, I've had reporters on, I had Gene Marbella on, who's been covering the court cases and like all of that. Sometimes I reach to you on that. I mean, that feels like that's a never ending pit, right? That feels like a total tar pit. These boys fighting with each other. Yeah, there's a well, look from a st- your first question is to Rob Manfred. What else is he going to say? Right. They've agreed on John being the control person. Uh, so, you know, is subsequently he going to say he doesn't agree with that? Like MLB approved. That's like MLB approving an owner to buy the team. And then two years later saying uh, we, we, we don't think he should own, he or she should own the team. So, um, but, you know, I don't know if there's really too much to say beyond um, what is behind that comment. It's, it's, you know, they're in a position where they've got to support all their owners, but generally speaking, I can't remember a time perhaps except when the Oakland A's were fighting each other in the dugout and they were winning uh, that, uh, that this kind of turmoil in the franchise or in the owner's suite, so to speak, has ever been positive for a team because generally it freezes all these assets in, in place, right? Teams aren't going to, organizations are probably not going to come in and do new sponsorship deals. It's impossible to do anything new in the media side. They still owe the nationals over a hundred million dollars. That has to be resolved too, as part of it. Um, 
So this is. But they don't is, think they owe the net. Like you no, say that, and I say well, that. But like, what does the yeah. court say? Well, so far, it not so much matters what the court just says yet. Major League Baseball's tribunal has said you own it. Uh, Masson and and the Orioles are trying to fight that in New York State appellate courts, of which they continually get postponed or conveniently get postponed. Look, the 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 linchpin to solve the Masson issue will be the sale of the Washington Nationals, right? The one thing or two things that are holding up the sale of the Washington Nationals are number one, agreeing on the price to buy the team, which I've heard there's there's a reasonable um, uh, reasonable range where people are are seriously likely to buy the team. But number two, the oh, the how much the Nationals are owed and when that gets paid and by whom is holding that up. So I think ultimately the Nationals issue gets settled. It's it's a forcing factor by the sale of the Washington Nationals. So, but while all those things are going on, how much do you owe? When will you pay it? Who will pay it? Are you going to take in additional partners in order to pay that? Um, clearly, the, the Mass and, and the Orioles don't have $100 million of cash flow that they can turn around. So it probably comes out of some sort of equity payments or long-term payments or whatever it's going to be. Um, while that is all going on, the franchise itself. Look, I think uh, Mike Elias is a very smart baseball guy. He might have been more careful in saying that we're ready to spend money. I think there are other ways to signal to the fan base that you're that you expect the team to be competitive this year compared to the previous four than saying about spending dollars. Because as I said earlier, when you say that phrase, people ultimately think about how active you're going to be in the free agent market, which let's face it, the Orioles have rarely been too active in the in the in the free agent market, except when Peter Angelos had his own dollars to put into the pot in order to be able to bring the Albert Bells and all the subsequent free agents uh, who might have come here in the past. Chris Davis. Uh, he is Marty Conway. He is the good professor at Georgetown. I'll bother you about football later, man. We got, you know, it's holiday season, the Lamar thing. Who's going to play? We got playoffs coming up. We got empty seats at the stadium. We got division games. All that's going on. And more than that, we have holiday cookies and fun for you. Hope you're doing well out there. I uh, hope the st student's almost done, right? Georgetown, we're getting to Absolutely. the end Absolutely. Right? We're, we're, we're now into finals, and then and then the semester ends, and, and we take that break. So. Um, it's it's a good time at the university. It tends to calm down. But again, look forward to seeing what you have on your uh, on your upcoming anniversary stuff. The the go go's thing, all that looks really cool. So I'll be I'll be watching for sure. I just need to play off football. They're eight and four. I can't have them stumble at this point. Marty Conway is here. He is at Marty Conway out on Twitter as well as on LinkedIn. Usually writing, uh, taking some time to do that on all things sports and business and and local, quite frankly. Speaking of local, we're going to be doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour this week at Fadley's. I'm wearing my Fadley shirt on Friday with Dan Rogers talking about his amazing, amazing play uh, that I, I can't wait to talk to him more about that. I think there may be an encore presentation that I'll have to tell everybody that loves Baltimore to go be a part of. On Thursday, we're doing the rock and roll anniversary, 31 years with the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery in conjunction with our friends at Goodwill and Window Nation. We will be at Costas, my homestead on North Point Boulevard in Old Dundalk with rock and roller and Hall of Famer Gina Shock of the Go-Go's. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking Baltimore positive.